Our next guest is so special to me. It, I have to share the story of how we met before I bring her in because it almost feels too normal for the crazy times that we're living in. I actually was invited to a dinner um, of a few lovely women and our guest was one of the guests coming and I knew that. So I researched her and looked her up before we got to the dinner and fell in love with her long before we actually met. And then at the dinner just confirmed that she was truly as spectacular as I knew she would be. And I'm excited to share her with you here because Beverly Schwartz is the author of a book, Rippling. And Rippling, I'm gonna to read to you from one of the testimonials on the book. Anyone who feels overwhelmed by the thought of making a difference in the world will be reassured by these change makers who teach us how small steps can lead to enormous global progress. And for all of us who dream of a more equitable, peaceful and safer world, Rippling is a welcome invitation to hear the voices of change makers everywhere. I know that you are going to be as inspired by Beverly as I have. So let me invite her in now. Beverly, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Lauren. It's a pleasure. And that was such a beautiful introduction. Isn't that um, fun? So Don't you love listening to people introduce you who really <laughs> love you and then you think to yourself, oh my God, is she, is she talking about me? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you know that we're here talking about inclusivity, diversity, um, equity, all the aspects of really creating a kinder, gentler, gentler uh, more welcoming world. And I believe that in your book and in the work that you've done with Ashoka, that you have actually focused on some of the stories that nobody would ever know and that we should all know about just because change making and really making a difference in the world doesn't belong to somebody else. It's not somebody else's responsibility. It really is the opportunity for all of us to step forward and make the world better, however that shows up for us. And every guest on our show today is focusing exactly on that. I would love to hear your perspective on how you came to write the book your work with Ashoka and in the world, and some of the stories that have really touched you. Thank you, I'd be more than happy to because the, the work I've done at Ashoka has truly changed my life and my outlook on life. And um, there really uh, were only a few books uh, uh, in a 2012 when I decided to work on this. There were only a few books out um, on social entrepreneurship. And even though the terminology um, has been around uh, over 20 years, uh, there were very few books. So I decided that the books that were out there were a bit academic, some of them. Um, some of them were fabulous, but there was room in there for some of the fellows, the, the people I have met through Ashoka that were doing some incredible global work uh, that needed to be told. And I really wanted to write up their stories to show people that um, though not everybody can be a social entrepreneur, everybody can create change um, in their own way and their own time. Um, and that it was something that's doable. I absolutely agree with you. Please, for our viewers, tell us what Ashoka is. Oh, certainly. So Ashoka is a global nonprofit organization um, that supports, uh, I should say finds and supports creative, cutting edge innovations in different countries uh, done by people that we term social entrepreneurs, which means that it's very exactly close to what an entrepreneur does, except the motivation and the mission is social instead of profit. So though a social entrepreneur could have a profit stream, um, that is not their initial focus. 
So they have started their enterprise or their entrepreneurial endeavor to change a social moray, a social um, problem that they became very involved with and need to change. Um, so by finding a cutting edge solution in their country, which means it doesn't have to be a cutting edge solution somewhere else, but for instance, you know, in an Arab country, um, having a woman come into your house to do home health care um, into a house that they're not related to by blood is very innovative. And anybody who actually can start a entrepreneurial business around that and change the home health care industry, which we consider a social endeavor, um, it's cutting edge. So um, that's what Ashoka does. And then they support these fellows financially for three years with a living wage stipend. And during those three years, they help them connect, network, and increase their visibility so that they can, in fact, get more funding to enlarge their organization and involve more change makers. And many of them have gone on to change laws around the country um, and also to spread um, like one of the uh, Peruvian women in the book has now spread to 133 countries. So um, these start from small endeavors and they spread around the world, which is the subtitle of the book. Absolutely, absolutely true. How social entrepreneurs spread innovation throughout the world. But I think most people don't necessarily think of social entrepreneurs as the people who are making these changes in movements like what we're now calling DEI, but in reading your book, what I realized was that all of these people are doing exactly what we're doing here. You know, back in the 60s, when Judy Human started focusing on the disabilities movement and became the mother of the disabilities movement, making it known that people needed access if they had wheelchairs and that people were capable if they had um, differently abled bodies and minds. And you talk about all of this in the book as advancing full citizenship. And that to me seemed like such an appropriate global approach because everyone brings something and everyone can solve a problem. So which are, I love the stories that you've already shared. Um, give us some other examples that really speak to you on this topic. Well, um, a lot of people around the world might have been um, exposed to the dialogue in the dark program or dining in the dark. In fact, there was a big success both in New York and in California where the social entrepreneur, Andreas Heineke, who is German, um, uh, had um, issues around blindness, not his own when he was a child, but other people, and realized um, how sensitive blind people were to things that he wasn't um, and how one day he got... Um, uh, he was a radio announcer and he got locked in a uh, room uh, with a blind person and they were looking for something and he couldn't find anything and uh, we couldn't find the door. And the blind person could, by sense and touch, could find exactly what they needed and get out of the room. And he realized that, um, that people who may be missing one sense um, are really gifted in other ways. And he developed um, a program to sensitize sighted people to the wisdom and the gifts of blind people um, and started an entire um, uh, event where people go in and they are blindfolded. Uh, they are led through different um, in the darkness by blind guides um, and they realize the things that they can't figure out that the blind guy need blind guide needs to help them with. Um, that turned into something called dining in the dark, where the waiters are all non-sighted, blind, um, and the people eat the food blindfolded, um, and how they are disadvantaged 
um, the outcome being that there's a lot more empathy for people who are blind and a lot more understanding of the gifts that they have that sighted people don't. Um, all about equalizing um, the way blind people and sighted people can work together. Which is brilliant. And I know you have, you have a lot of stories that would show us that heightened level of sensitivity and talent. I remember there's one from the book about a group of boys with autism. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorite because the, um, the person who started that, Thorkel Sohn, who's Danish, um, actually, um, uh, the program, he's actually has a, a 501c3 now in Delaware. So he's come to the United States. Um, and his son, Lars, um, at three years old, they realized he had autism and such that um, he didn't function uh, on some levels the way other children did. He and his wife got very concerned about what would happen after they are no longer there as mother and father and would Lars be able to folk, you know, to be on his own. Um, so Thorkel was a software engineer and he said, you know, from knowing my son, I could see he's very focused. He gets very focused and, and, and likes doing little things and building things and whatnot. So he, decided to test out a theory that people with autism would be really good at finding software bugs in software programs because you have to be very focused and on minutia in order to figure out and have the patience to figure out um, where the bugs are in a software program. So given his connections with IBM and other software companies, um, he developed a program of training for uh, people with um, autism, um, a certain spectrum on, the, on autism. Um, and he figured out what they need, how they need to succeed in an office, uh, given the fact that they don't like a lot of noise, um, they don't like a lot of people around. Um, and he not only decide, developed a training program for people with autism, which basically starts with building Lego um, in order to focus and figure out what's wrong and how to build and then how to unbuild, but also training places like IBM, which is his biggest client, by the way, how to, what kind of ways they have to be around people with autism, where they have to work, what they need to work with, what the quiet they need with, and in fact has built an entire program around getting people with autism positions in the software industry where they can learn how to make their own way in the world, get their own finances, and eventually live on their own so that it takes a burden off of society, it takes a burden off of parents and family members, and provides an entire way of looking differently um, to towards people with autism. Which is amazing. And again, to your point of advancing full citizenship, enabling people who have historically been dependent on the system because the system hasn't supported them, now creating new systems is what it's all about. And that's what the corporations and that's what these passionate social entrepreneurs are, are really doing is starting from passion and moving into profit. And that's just a reverse of what we're accustomed to from entrepreneurs. You've got another chapter that I think um, we really would, I would like to address here briefly is the interfaith initiatives, because I also believe that not only is that something that advances a level of full citizenship, but it takes communities that are historically separate, bringing them together, which creates a better community. So share a little bit about that one. Well, um, Ibu Patel is um, of Indian descent, and he was bullied when he was a child in school uh, for both being different which is ex exactly what the book was trying to help um, notice, not notice the differences and embrace the differences. 
um, and again for his religion. Um, and uh, he grew up in America. He, uh, and he, as he got older, he decided that um, it was time to change people's attitude about um, being separate in their religion from other people. And that understanding that religious people share more than they don't share, um, that they all believe in a higher power, no matter what that higher power is. And most all religions of the world have certain rules and regulations around um, sharing with people, community, empathy for others, caring for others, um, and that he wanted to make that his life's work. So he decided to start um, an innovation um, and an entrepreneurial endeavor around training um, students, uh, ministerial students, rabbinical students, um, students of religion, um, how to incorporate other people with other religions into their teachings and into their mindsets so that as this generation uh, leads congregations around the world, that they would have empathy and understanding and they would in turn um, give the, the congregations, share with the congregations that same empathy and understanding. Um, and that has spread around the world also through schools of teaching religion. Um, because most schools that teach religion are um, embracing this as a way of making the world a better place. Beverly, I could, I could actually have you sit here and talk about every chapter in the book because every person you have featured has made such an enormous difference. I'm going to encourage our viewers to find your book. It's called Rippling and we'll put it up here on the screen. And we'll also put the link in the blog. And also, if you're interested to look for Ashoka, and we'll put that information on the screen as well. Beverly, of course, is available online if you want to know more about her. I thank you so much for coming to share with us today. This has really been so special. Thank you, Lauren. And, and can I just say one extra thing? Please. So the book has changed me in ways of I think about things as well, is writing up these stories. But I wanted to give an example of that to people also about not only reading the book, but thinking differently uh, and more inclusively. Um, Thorkel Sohn in his book about autism had a line which has never left me. And he said, when I now go to a supermarket and see a child screaming and having a tantrum in a store, I used to be very annoyed and agitated. Um, same thing in an air, airplane. And now I realize that this mother or this father has a child that might have autism and that we all have to be a little bit more understanding of these parents and the child and what they're going through. And I have to tell you, this has turned my life around. You know how when you're in an airplane and there's a child that's crying the whole time and you say, ah, I have to go to sleep. And now I say, you know, I feel um, it's okay. It's okay. It, it does bother me, but I'm not the parent. I'm not the child. And they are doing a good job trying to do what they're trying to do. So that to me is is really the crux of advancing citizenship and being understanding for people who are different, differently abled. Um, and that's what I hope people get out of your podcast and out of this interview. Um, and it's a pleasure to be with you and thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. And yes, we could all use a little extra empathy for so many good reasons. So thank you for sharing that. And we'll be right back.